Locked On Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Hawkeye Nation, to another episode of the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast, your daily podcast covering your Iowa Hawkeyes on the Locked On Podcast Network. As we do after every single Iowa game, win or lose, though, we are joined by former Iowa running back LaShawn Daniels. As always, myself, I'm Andrew Wade, and we are here to break down what went wrong in yesterday's game. It was uh, it was an ugly game, to say the least. But before we get into that, I want to thank you all for making the Locked on Hawkeyes podcast your first listen every single day. You can find the Locked on Hawkeyes podcast for free Monday through Friday, wherever you get podcasts at, and also on YouTube as well by searching Locked on Hawkeyes. LaShawn. Before we get into this disastrous game, how are you, man? How are you personally doing? How is your life going? <laughs> uh, high school football is over, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, personally, I mean, I'm doing well, doing well. <laughs> uh, I mean, again, we didn't have, uh, coaching-wise, we didn't have the type of season that we were looking for, but we did finish uh, strong in our last couple games of the year, which was nice. Um, and, you know, I was able to coach some good running backs. Uh, this year, which was which was fun, fun as well. But but I mean, no, nah, I mean, we're doing doing well personally. Um, obviously, I've done better after Hawkeye games before, but uh, no, nah, we're doing all right. We're doing all right. And it's part of the job, man. Uh, I wish we could talk about an Iowa win every single time, but uh, there are going to be losses. There's only one time in the last 30 years that Iowa has went undefeated. In regular season play so there was bound to be a loss or two i just uh i personally didn't think it was going to be like this i thought we would at least be competitive in these mm-hmm. games so that's kind of frustrating um you have some fun stuff today right you're going to the bears game though bears playing at 11 versus the 49ers yeah yep yep they'll be playing the niners unfortunately uh george isn't going to be playing and cj obviously doesn't play for the niners anymore uh but no, I mean it'll still be a good time. Get to watch James play. Um, anytime I can watch James play, it's a good time. So awesome, man. Well, sounds like you have some good stuff going on today. Get you, hopefully the Bears can get on track and get a W as well. <laughs> but that'll be uh, an interesting situation, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> nonetheless. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's get into it though. That that was that was just a terrible game. I mean, I think uh, we all saw it. Wisconsin got up to a twenty to nothing lead on Iowa. The first drive that Wisconsin drove down the field can be kind of expected, right? I mean, when we when we see Phil Parker's defense, typically teams have a good drive in the first quarter. It's kind of like clockwork. And then the defense buckles up, they settle down, and they slow down that offense. And that's exactly what they did. They, they stopped Wisconsin several times. They forced Wisconsin into field goals several times, despite having their backs against the wall due to really poor field position uh, given up by Iowa. Um, did you have any takeaways from the performance of the defense in this game? Um, yeah, I mean, the defense, I thought, played a great game. I think they played more than um, well enough for us to be competitive and actually win that football game. Um, I thought they were doing a great job with the cards that they were dealt. Um, I mean, you know, being on short field every single drive, I mean, it's it's tough to win a football game like that. It's very tough to win a football game like that. But, I mean, there were times where the defense buckled down, um, you know, either held them to the field goal or even had that that goal line stand, which was fantastic. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I thought the defense, you know, played extremely well. I mean, they gave up what it was like, it was like, what, 270 yards of total offense, right? Yep. Um, and, you know, they held them uh, most, of the, most of the time. Um, so, yeah, just got to give the defense plenty of credit. Uh, for going out there and actually deciding to play some football and, um, you know, be competitive um, and try to take it to Wisconsin. So, Yeah, you mentioned uh, playing well. They stopped – they only allowed 104 passing yards to Graham Mertz, which is actually a decent day for Graham Mertz considering how bad he has been. But uh, 11 of 22 passing, to, considering you're missing two of your cornerbacks, that's pretty solid. Wisconsin rushing 48 attempts, 166 yards, a 3.5 yard per carry average Chas Chesmalusi 19 carries 48 yards 2.5 yard per carry average that's way better than what Purdue did I mean we did exactly what we need to do from a defensive perspective as you said we held them to a very relatively poor 
offensive showing. Mm -hmm. We didn't let them run the ball the way they wanted to run the ball consistently throughout the game. They did early on target Jamari Harris. So I think it's important to note Riley Moss out. Terry Roberts was a late scratch as well. Um, sounds like that was something that was being kind of on the rumor mill for a couple of days. I heard about it, I think, on Wednesday, I believe. I uh, wasn't sure what was happening. Obviously, we weren't going to hear anything from the coaches. Jamari Harris gets his first start in this game. They kind of picked on him a little bit early on, but um, overall, I thought he settled down and played really well. My question to you was, or is, from an offensive perspective, when the other unit is not performing well, does that piss you off? Because the defense played a good enough game to win that ball game, and the offense just couldn't get it done. Does that make you mad if you were on the flip side of that? Uh, you know, obviously it's really, really frustrating, like extremely frustrating um, from a player standpoint because it's like um, – I mean, I'm just thinking like as a defensive player, I mean, heck, you guys get a stop. Um, you know, you're off the field for <laughs> a minute and a half, and next thing you know, you're back up. Uh, it can be very, very frustrating because it feels like, like, you know, it's just the other side is not getting done, but you know that that's football. So like, you kind of know, like, Hey, like we have to do our job on this side as much as possible, right. To make it easier for the other side. Um, and I know, you know, being at Iowa, we never, had, it wasn't too often that the offense was on that side. Um, but still, it was still something that is, you know, expected right when the one unit isn't doing so hot. Um, the other unit is supposed to help pick, pick us up, um, you know, as much as possible. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, our offense hasn't been able to do that the last uh, couple games. So, yeah, it's uh, it's tough. When when I was down 10 nothing, we fumble the football within three plays. We stop Wisconsin at the goal line. We turn right back around. And I, I don't know. We're going to have to break down that handoff here in a second. Ivory Kelly Martin fumbles the football at the one yard line or the two yard line, excuse me. Wisconsin goes in for a touchdown. We get the ball back. We do nothing with it. We punt the ball. Wisconsin punts the ball back to us. And then we muff the punt. Uh, I mean, that th now that's tough. Fielding punts is not necessarily easy. We had our backup punt returner in there. Um, but Max Cooper is a fifth year senior. Uh, you got to be able to get it done. Ivory Kelly Martin is an older guy as well. I mean, these are these are veteran players. These are not young freshmen in their very first moment playing collegiate football. Um, can you walk through what, what happened on that handoff between Spencer and Ivory? Did It it looked like Ivory just didn't realize the ball was going to be there. Yeah, I don't know what it was. I mean, I know the announcers had mentioned something like he just didn't get it cleanly, which, I mean, I thought, I mean, I thought Spencer put it in the pocket um, it, I couldn't tell from the angle that they showed. I mean, he must just not have just grabbed the football, which is what <laughs> I'm thinking. Like, I mean, there's literally other, like no other explanation for it. I mean, it looked like Spencer put it, um, you know, right in his little pocket. Um, and, uh, Ivory either didn't just grab the football or didn't roll over the football. Um, you know, like your typical running back technique is, um, and, you know, obviously it was a, huge huge turnover and an inopportune time uh so that's like what i saw from you know a film perspective um just watching the game the on the first 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 go around um but yeah i mean it looked like it's it was probably ivory's fault even though most of the time like the quarterback always gets the plane for um exchanges but it looked like ivory just didn't even grab the football yeah, well, Spencer gets plenty of blame um, most days anyway, so I think we can kind of spread that around if we if we need to. It's unfortunate. Um, I I, I want to see Ivory Kelly Martin succeed. I think he's the kind of player who's been in the program for a while. He clearly wants to do things the right way. When everything kind of um, went down last summer, he was one of the guys that was being a leader in the locker room. He was the one speaking to the media. He was trying to keep the team together. Uh, he's been He started out as a starter three years ago has went through uh, kind of the ringer of losing his job multiple times and yet still sticking it out and possibly coming back for next year's next year's team to potentially try to be the starter again. Um, it, it's just, it's unfortunate to see that happen. I, I not that I wish that would happen on anyone else 
But it's just it kind of stinks to see it happen to Ivory Kelly Martin. I do want to talk about Spencer because there is a controversy of brewing in Hawkeye Nation with this offense. People want change. They want something to be different. And it just hasn't been that way for the last two weeks. So we're going to talk about that here in a few short moments. I do want to tell you all about prize picks. College football fanatics, you got to listen up because prize picks is daily fantasy made easy. I personally love this, and I know that you will too. Prize Picks is a leader in college sports daily fantasy. They offer more college football props than anyone in the world, and they offer all of the star players of the Power Fives as well as mid-major players you might not have even heard of. Prize Picks offers any prop you can think of, from yardage to touchdowns, even interceptions thrown. I would have loved to see. I didn't get a chance to look at it, but I would have loved to see what those props were for the Iowa-Wisconsin game. I'm sure it was something like 100 yards throwing for each quarterback, which you could have <laughs> almost hit there. But prize picks is awesome. You can combine multiple sports. You pick two to five players, and then you can win up to 10x on any entry. And the best part about this is when you go to sign up for prizepicks.com and you use the promo code locked on, L O C K E D O N, you'll get a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. These entries can be made within 60 seconds or less. It is that easy. So don't hesitate. Check out prizepicks.com and use the promo code locked on, or go to your app store and download the app today. Prize picks is daily fantasy made easy. Woo, my voice cracked at the end of that ad read, but <laughs> we are we are appreciative of y'all listening to the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast, making the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast your first listen every single day, Monday through Friday, wherever you get podcasts at, and also on YouTube as well. Just search Locked On Hawkeyes. All right, let's get past. Hopefully my voice won't crack again. Uh, clearly, clearly struggling there. LaShawn, we talked about the offense, talked about the, the fumble. We talked about putting the defense in a bad position. What we haven't talked about yet is how bad this offensive line has been and whether or not Spencer Petrus is the guy to lead the Iowa Hawkeyes. Um, let's maybe start with the offensive line. I don't want to – we have plenty of time to talk about Spencer, and we've talked about Spencer literally every show for the last, gosh, I don't know, two seasons at this point. It's, uh, it's become a, a topic that's always on the, the recap show. This offensive line, though, we mentioned the fact going against that Purdue team and going into a bye week, we need to clean up some things from a technique perspective. We need to get right. These younger guys – they have a quicker, not a quicker learning curve, but a steeper learning curve, but the ability to make progress very quickly because there's so much to learn. Well, we come into this bye week, we go up against Wisconsin, and I know Wisconsin runs a 3-4 defense. That can be difficult to account for which guy is coming where. There were several times, though, on a three-man rush where our guys didn't know who to block. It felt like more so than any week that we've seen, it was not necessarily just our guys getting overpowered, although there were several times of that. There were times where our guys just didn't block a guy. Or I, I saw Mason Richmond kick out, and a guy would just go right past him. He was looking for a guy coming on the edge. No one came. Guy coming right past him. How much of that can you account to the 3-4 defense being confusing and that scheme being tough for younger guys to recognize versus I don't even know how do we account for the rest of that. That was, that was just ugly. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you got to give credit to Wisconsin. I mean, they do a great job defensively every single year for as long as I can remember. Um, but, you know, going against a 3-4 is more difficult because, because your pass protection does change slightly, um, and the rules change a little bit, um, you know, whether we're doing, you know, a pocket protection, which is where the running back has weak side um, responsibilities or we're doing turn protection where the running back has uh, strong side responsibilities. Um, and it does vary. The protections does change because now you have uh, an extra linebacker, a guy who's standing up and one less lineman. Um, so it does make it a little bit more difficult, especially when we have young guys in there. Um, right. I mean, it's not something that we go against very often. Right. I mean, we're always practicing usually against a four, or either practicing against a four down front or we're practicing against some type of five man front look, right? Where they got guys up standing up and kind of all over the place and not really a three, four look. Um, but, you know, obviously a lot of it comes from, you know, having to learn from that um, who to block, who our responsibilities are. Um, but for the most part, it, it doesn't change too much, but I can understand how it can be confusing for young football players. Um, like our guys. And, you know, I think that obviously contributed a lot to the game because I, our, I just feel like our guys were not playing on first off on the offensive line. I haven't felt like the uh, offensive line has played fast at all the entire year outside of Tyler. Um, 
basically, I don't know if they if they really played fast the entire year at all. Really, if I'm being quite honest, I mean, it just feels like um, they're thinking so much out there. Um, the wheels are spinning so fast that um, they're thinking of not making any mistakes. And well, and that's in turn, it's right. It's making them play a lot slower, which you obviously can't do, especially in Big Ten football play. Right? I mean, you got defensive linemen who are going to be defensive linemen and linebackers who are going to be playing on Sundays. Um, and, you know, if you're out there playing slow and, you know, you're thinking too much, right, that those half seconds, um, you know, make huge differences, right? And then um, outside of that, outside of just, um, you know, knowing what to do, I just felt like our fundamentals aren't really there. I feel like our eyes aren't looking in the spots we're supposed to be looking. Um, and the rotation of like eight guys is not, really working i feel like at this point um and i would much rather you know obviously i'm not in the building i don't know what's going on now right but i would much rather our guys kind of um settle in on you know five guys five six guys right that they really really trust um at this point in the time of the season and kind of just go all in with them um and just make sure that the other guys are ready Right. If something does happen, but kind of go all in with five or six guys, because, again, things are happening so fast in the game. And when you have guys that are in on one drive and then you have another set of guys that are in the next drive. Yeah, obviously, you know, coaches are seeing everything above. But I mean, the players aren't right. I mean, you see something that happens on one drive, especially a team like Wisconsin. They're going to change up looks and bring different, different things. And then next drive, you have different guys in there. They didn't see what happened before. So it's harder for them to be able to make the right adjustments to know exactly what to look for because, again, they weren't in the football game. So that's really kind of my thoughts, you know, right now on the offensive line. And it's very frustrating um, because, you know, when it comes to offensive line play, you know that we're usually going to have, um, you know, a pretty good unit out there, um, a pretty consistent unit. Um, and it's frustrating at this point in the season you know, through our, what I was at our eighth game. Um, and, you know, we don't have any consistency there. Yeah. I mean, you hit, the, I think you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, when you're eight games in and you're rotating eight guys through a five man, like through a five position spot, I cannot say that word very correctly, very well, but when you're rotating eight guys through five positions, eight games in, there's a problem. That's okay. Early on in the season, you're trying to figure things out, work things out. I know there's been injuries. We're eight games in. People are getting healthy. Kyler shot. I, I, I Kyler shot's an awesome player, but conditioning cannot be an excuse for for two months now. You, you've got to be able to. You, you've got to be ready to go. I know Cody Ince has been battling a few things. Everything we heard though is he's been practicing. I, I just, I, yeah, I, I don't understand how you're eight games in and you still don't know who the starters are or who the main guys should be. And if you're trying to just flip flop guys to get some sort of positive momentum, that's a problem. You, it is it is not going to work. Um, it looked like Iowa might have changed up a little bit of their blocking scheme from first half to second half. They came out running the ball pretty well um, early on to start the second half. Did you notice that as well, or is that something I'm just making up in my head? Well, you know, we're going to make adjustments, right? We're, make, we're a team who we always make adjustments um, no matter what, whether we're, um, you know, up by 40 or down by 40. Or we're obviously in a tight ball game, and halftime we're going to make adjustments. Um, and, you know, we have – there are some, there are some smart coaching coaches on our offensive staff, right? So, um, you know, we're able to make some adjustments and we're coming out – able to come out a little bit stronger and play our – a little bit more of our brand of football. But, I mean, still, I mean, it it didn't really convert to too much, um, you know, besides the one score that we did have. Um, but, you know, I did feel like we did come out a little bit stronger in the second half. Um, but – you know, frankly, it just obviously just wasn't wasn't enough. Yeah, and you mentioned running the ball. Uh, last time we chatted, we were talking about two quarterback sneaks back to back to get a first down on a fourth down play. Now we got to talk about two fullback dives. Um, <laughs> I'm very, I'll be very here's interested to hear your uh, hear your answer on this based off of your initial uh, nonverbal response here. But um, what are we thinking here? Uh, the the full. The quarterback sneak, I know we talked about it. I could at least justify that in my mind. The fact that the quarterback sneak has typically been successful for us. The fullback dive, to a degree, has been successful at times. 
but clearly against Wisconsin, it was it was not working. And actually, we're getting to to a little break here, so we're gonna. I want you to mull on that, and we're gonna talk about the fullback dive when we come back. Before we get to that, though, I want to tell you all about Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar on the market today. If you haven't tried Built Bar now, you are missing out. You have to try it out. It's a protein bar, but it doesn't taste like one. It's honestly phenomenally delicious. It tastes so good. It's not chalky. It's not waxy. It's not hard to choke down. I've tried plenty of protein bars, and they've mostly all stunk. These are freaking awesome, and you have to try them today. Built Bars are low-carb, low-calorie, low-fat, low-sugar, and high in protein. So you get all the healthy benefits on top of just being really, really delicious. And this month, they're having new flavors come out every three to four days. So check it out. Even if you've already gotten a box of Built Bars, you've got to check it out, see if there's new flavors coming out. Check out to see if pumpkin chocolate chip comes out because pumpkin chocolate chip is one of my favorites as well. I ordered a couple boxes last year and it is really, really good. So go to built.com and use the promo code LOCKED15, that's L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, and you'll get 15% off your order. Use the promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. LaShawn, I wanted to just sit there for a second. We talked about the fullback dive. I I brought it up. Let me hear from you. What are your thoughts on doing back-to-back fullback dives against a run defense that has been stopping us all day and also has been plugging the hole when we're trying to do fullback dives? Yeah. um, And, you know, I got to start us off. Obviously, I love my fullbacks. Every single fullback I've ever had, um, you know, has done a great job from high school through college, NFL, right? I mean, I've had great fullbacks um, who go in there and, when they stick your stick their head in there to you know go block guys who uh, have bad intentions, um, and obviously you want to reward them by giving them a football sometimes, right? Um, and you know I get it, right? I mean we haven't very been. Um, with all that being said, though, like we haven't been great on short yardage for a very long time. I mean I feel like whenever we run traditional offense, I mean heck, even when I was there, right, we weren't very great good on short yardage um, plays. So. Um, and I get it right. The fullback dive is a little bit, it's very similar to a quarterback sneak, um, in a sense where you can essentially just, you know, wedge block it. Right. And, um, you know, have the, have the ball carrier just fall forward for, for a yard or two. Um, but you know, when you look at how they lined up, right. They once Wisconsin basically did a very, they lined up very similarly, um, to how Purdue did, um, a couple weeks back, you know, on the short yardage um, when we ran the two quarterback sneaks, they lined up very similar where they had basically like four guys within, you know, both guards and the center, um, knowing right where we're going to run the football. And, um, you know, I think having adjustments is very important, which I think I like, don't quote me on this, but I want to say when before that timeout was called, Right, I want to say they must have had the same play called, and it looked like Spencer was checking the football play based on their alignment because that's how Wisconsin came up and lined up. So I'm not sure if they had checks built in or Spencer wanted to check the play, um, you know, to get into a better look where we could, you know, move a gap over, or, you know, get tired of the ball and get, um, you know, a little bit more off tackle. Um, but it looked like that they had, you know, changes in there. I don't know what happened in the timeout. Um, you know, they most obviously went, talked over, and just said, and probably just asked the guys, like, hey, can we get this on a fullback dive? And obviously, you know, most of the time they're just going to say, of course, our guys are going to say, yeah, yeah, we can get it or whatever. Um, but, you know, knowing how they're lined up and knowing how much success Wisconsin's defense was having, I feel like playing into exactly what they wanted us to do was not the right um way to go right and i'm not again i'm not calling plays right i don't know what they saw um what they went over you know after the purdue game and what they saw leading into this week um but you know with knowing how our offense has been performing i feel like playing into what the defense wanted us to do and just trying to win off of hey where our guys are better than your guys um type of mentality just Frankly, this wasn't really the, the way to go. And obviously, um, it didn't end up turning out our on, on our favor. And I mean, yeah, I mean, Monty probably got a bad spot on it. But I mean, still, right? I mean, I, there, there are so many different things that we could have done in the playbook that um, I feel like would have been a lot, a lot more successful than trying just to play into Wisconsin's hands. 
Yeah, uh, the, the way I equated it on, on Twitter was it felt like we were almost playing scared to try new things, to do something a little bit different. We were just trying to stick with what we always do versus thinking, you know what? We're in it. We have to, we're trying to win this game. This is this is a play that decides this game. Kirk even said it in his press conference. After that, the game was over. So why are you going out there and doing back-to-back fullback dives? Give your guys a chance. Do something different. You know how big of a well, not I'm not saying you know, you definitely know what I'm about to say. But when you when you have a play like that and you maybe you do an end around or you do a quick you do something that's different that Wisconsin's not expecting, and maybe you get a big play from that, maybe you get a touchdown, that is a huge momentum changing play that could have com- mm. completely changed the outcome of the game. Yeah. Um, I, I just I don't understand why we're not making slight changes to switch it up. It feels like we're every single game. It gets to the point now where I know what we're running. Uh, there was a play, I think it was in the second half against Wisconsin. We land, lined up. Uh, we had an overloaded formation on the left side. And I was like, well, they're running to the left. What do we do? We ran to the left. I mean, like, there's just there's just not a lot of variability. Teams can line up. And you better – I mean, everyone knows what Iowa's going to do. They've been seeing this offense for – and, yes, there's been new offensive coordinators – but for the most part, a lot of the, the general principles have been the same. For the last 20, 23 years, since Kirk Ferentz has taken over, teams know what's going to happen, and teams know what we're going to do. And when we get up and line up and we don't change it up, it's just it's frustrating to watch from a, a fan perspective. I can only imagine it's frustrating uh, for you to watch from a player perspective. Um, let's talk a little bit about the quarterback position, though. Uh, when an offensive line is doing as poorly as our offensive line is, there's, there's a couple ways that you can – can try to alleviate the pressure from the offensive line not being able to handle pass protection. You can put more guys in pass protection. You can leave running backs, tight ends to chip some guys when they're going out for the routes. Uh, you do some quick passing plays, which has been a struggle for us because our guys either aren't getting open or Spencer's not delivering it on time. Or you have a mobile quarterback who can break the pocket and make things happen with his legs. We are very aware Spencer is literally incapable of doing that. Uh, he tried one time to scramble. I think he got three or four yards, but it looked it, – it, I'm not trying to be rude on Spencer. I, I've, I've been a Spencer homer this whole year trying to support him, but it looked like my grandpa trying to run to get a couple yards. I mean, it was just – it was crotchety and just not really the most fluid movement I've seen. Um, Alex Badia comes in. He makes a play with his legs, delivers a nice pass on the sideline, and now everyone believes that there is a quarterback controversy. Um I'm putting you in a tough position here because I know you don't want to ever talk uh, badly or poorly about Iowa football players. Who would you start at this point? Would you start Spencer or Alex? Do you feel like you've seen enough from Spencer? Do you feel like we have a better shot with Alex? I mean, this is starting to remind – and and uh, before I get to that, it's kind of starting to remind me a little bit of that controversy you probably went through when you were at Iowa where we switched quarterbacks, uh, went from Jake to, to CJ. Um CJ had a bit more of a scrambling ability. I'm not saying Alex is CJ, but just what are your thoughts on the whole situation? Yeah. um, You know, as far as who I would start, I mean, it's tough, right? I mean, I'm just going off of what I see on Saturdays, right? I'm not in there in practices. You know, I wasn't in there through this um, preparation um, throughout the week, let alone, you know, in the summer and springtime, right? Um, And... Yeah, I mean, obviously, I love the fact that our, you know, our offensive line is still struggling and we haven't made any really made any strides throughout the year is very concerning. And obviously, a way to leave that is, you know, some of the things that you said, right? I mean, you do some chips, um, you do some play actions, um, you do things to keep um, the defense from pinning their ears back, right? And then obviously, you got to add quick throws um, where, you know, a quarterback can kind of sit there, get the ball out of his hands very quickly, right? I mean, you look at, um, you know, like a team like uh, you just look at Tom Brady's career, for example, right? He's never been a mobile guy, right? I mean, he just sits in the pocket, he gets the ball out fast, right? And he, but he puts it where it needs to be, right? And um, when you do have a struggling online, I mean, that's kind of the recipe that has to be. Unfortunately, um, we haven't done those things, right? We haven't chipped nowhere near as much as I would like. We don't do as much um, play actions as much as I would like. We don't you know, do a whole bunch of different things, you know, from a play calling standpoint that I think would obviously help the offensive line quite a bit. Um, And, you know, obviously Spencer just hasn't been able to 
you know, make the throws on time, you know, put the ball where it needs to be. And, you know, we have receivers that are dropping passes as well, right? Which obviously isn't helping. So um I'm personally I've always been a fan of mobile quarterbacks, right? I love the ability that mobile quarterbacks have and being able to extend the football play when things do break down and things don't go perfect, right? They're able to at least create, you know, with their legs, right? Instead of you know, it just being basically a jugs machine back there, you know, looking for, for people to throw to. Right. So, um, you know, I, again, I'm always a fan of mobile quarterbacks. Uh, right. I mean, I love when we made the change to, to CJ, even though Jake, I gotta get this out there. Jake wasn't, you know, terrible, right. He obviously wasn't a bad quarterback at all. And he was decently mobile, right. He could, um, you know, move throughout the pocket. He could, convert plays with his legs um and obviously he was a good throw of the football i mean he left us and threw for like three thousand yards over at and michigan played on the lions and for then, a second yeah and was oh, yeah he's been a back, back of quarterback in the nfl for quite a bit so like um obviously like he was a good he was a good football player uh right but you know i just loved kind of the game breaking ability that cj did have with his running ability um and you know obviously he was able to convert you know a lot of on a lot of big throws um as well so you know um personally i'm a, I'm a fan of running quarterbacks um but obviously i don't i mean i didn't think you know kirk had said um that there really is no controversy uh as far as the quarterback position goes um and it's going to be spencer as long as he's healthy um but yeah, I mean, just so it's out there, I love mobile quarterbacks. And I would at any time, like if I was if I was a coach, right, I'm putting my mobile quarterback in there because um, you know, I just love that they have the ability that they have because they can, you know, extend the play with their legs um and create. But I think obviously Spencer's gonna be in there. So obviously I'm gonna rally behind Spencer. Um, but obviously he's just gotta be able to, you know, make some of these some of these throws. He's gotta be able to make the decisions, you know, in his head quicker. Right. And, um, you know, give the give the guys a chance um, to convert on plays. And obviously other guys got to help them. Right. The offense line has to be able to uh, make the decisions. I mean, make the make the blocks in the passing game. And, you know, receivers obviously have to come down with footballs when the ball is on target. Right. We got to catch them. So, yeah. Um, in looking at this game, I went back to look at the stats. There's only three drops credited towards our Iowa receivers. I would argue there's probably four to five that you could say is a mix of Spencer not placing the ball correctly, and our wide receivers probably should have came down with it, although they're not getting credited with the drop. So overall, I thought that was not a very good thing to see. Um, interestingly enough, and, and I don't want to get into this too deeply, but Tyrone Tracy Jr., coming into the season, I thought he was going to be our X factor. I thought he was going to be a, the guy to step in and replace Amir Smith Marset and Brandon Smith. I personally felt like he was a nice mix of both. He didn't have the, the speed of Amir. He didn't have the contested catch ability of Brandon, but he was just a tier or two below on both those aspects with better yak ability, in my personal opinion. We have not seen that from Tyrone this year to this point. Um, this past game, only one reception, only one target. And uh, there was some interesting stuff put out on Twitter uh, by members of his family. Um, I don't want to get into that too much. I just, I, I guess I'm just, I, I don't know what's going on. I, I don't understand how we can't get the ball to Tyrone. Um, and then when we see guys like Keegan Johnson come in, Keegan has looked phenomenal in every snap he's gotten that's been meaningful. I mean, he came in there and took that end around and fought for yards. It looked like he was like, I'm going to get to the end zone. Uh, I loved I loved what we saw from Keegan when he came in and then came up with another catch as well just a few moments later. So um, I, I guess I, I don't even know what question I'm trying to ask here, to, to be honest. I just um, it's frustrating to see. I don't understand how we're not getting Tyrone involved. Um, I, I, I don't understand why we're not getting Keegan more involved uh, because clearly we're not we're not getting the production we need at the wide receiver position. Uh, guys aren't getting open for Spencer when they are getting open. Spencer open. Spencer's not delivering it well and they're not catching it. Um, I guess open-ended statement for me anything you want to say on that before we touch on some some higher level concepts from iowa yeah so for starters i see i gotta give keegan a lot of credit um i think yesterday he did have a drop so we'll get that out there he he did have a drop. yeah he had a couple drops yesterday um which obviously knows that he can't have 
But those aside, right, I love that his love his ability um, when he gets the football in his hands, right? I mean, he treats – he looks like every time he touches the football, he's like – he doesn't know if it's going to be the last time he's going to touch it. <laughs> um, so, like, he's like going he's out there. for his life. He's like, I'm going <laughs> to die if I don't score the touchdown or score the football at this. Yeah, yeah. Like, he's out there, um, you know, trying to make a play every single time he touches the football, which I love, right? I think he – I mean, he runs through contact um like he's a running back which i love i mean as a young as a young guy right it's already that's already hard enough to do um you know throughout your career just to run through contact break tackles um but to do it as a freshman is fantastic right and i obviously think that he has an extremely bright future um you know obviously he's just obviously got to get more consistent um with catching some of those you know tougher catches right where guys are on your back and kind of roped over top of you um but i love his ability love his ability now, you know, as far as the, the Tyrone Tracy situation, you know, I don't I don't really know what's going on there. Um, obviously, Tyrone's not having the season he wants at all. Right. Um, and, you know, one one catch on one target, I mean, um, is obviously very, very frustrating for a guy who I felt like was a very it was a huge playmaker. I mean, thinking back, I mean, heck. Uh, a few years back, right when he had that touchdown against uh Northwestern, right where he broke like three tackles, right, and then took it for a long touchdown. Yep. Um, you know, obviously, we know that he has great ability with the football in his hands, and I don't know what's going on if he's um, if you know, he fell out of favor, you know, with coaches in the building, um, if he's not practicing well or what it is, but um, whatever, whatever the situation is obviously needs to get fixed, right? Because he is a playmaker um, with the football in his hands and, you know, getting the play, the ball in our playmaker's hands um, is very important, right? I mean, that's part, that's part of, you know, having success as a, on, on the offense, right? And getting the football in playmaker's hands, right? Getting it in Tyler's hands, right? Getting it in uh, Sam Laporta's hands, getting it in Keegan's hands, um, Tyrone's hands, right? Um, Charlie Jones, um, and then even Nico, right? I mean, getting it in their hands, right, where guys can make plays. And I feel like we are not doing a good job of that at all, at all. I mean, you just go through the stats, right? Um, and, you know, not that many people, it seems like not that many people are really touching the ball. And if they are touching the ball, right, nothing's really happened with it or the play is just um, completely dead or, or whatever. So, you know, it's very frustrating. It's very, very frustrating to watch because you obviously know that you have talent, talented guys um, all over the field, and you have talented guys who you can't get the football to. And, you know, frankly, we're just, just not doing a great job of it, right? There's not, not a, as much creativity um, that I would like to be able to get these guys a football. So, obviously, it's something that's got to be fixed, right? You got to start just thinking – you know, way outside the box that, that, that we're in um, because, you know, obviously like what we're doing isn't, isn't working. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. When you look at the snap counts, I thought this was really interesting too. Uh, Keegan Johnson actually led the wide receiver group and snapped with 44. Now a lot of that came, some of that came in, in garbage time towards the end. Um, Tyrone Tracy checked in at third and snap. So Nico had 35, Tyrone had a 30, uh, Charlie had at 21. So interesting when you see what is exposed to be your number one wide receiver coming out of camp, there was a lot of hype in Tyrone. Um, the coaches have talked very highly about Tyrone the entire time. And now he is third in snaps. You have his family posting things on Twitter, uh, which is probably never a good spot to air out your grievances um, and concerns about uh, Tyrone. Uh, I don't want to ever speculate on, on transfer situations, but um, definitely a situation to, to monitor going forward. If if Tyrone continues to not be involved in the offense, um, you know he ultimately has to do what's best for him. And if he's not getting involved and he has aspirations, I mean, if you're catching one ball a game in the Big Ten for Iowa, that's going to be tough to uh, make scouts notice you. So um, interesting thing to watch as we move forward. Um, wanted to talk about two kind of more general concepts, um, recruiting. How does how does a game like that or two games like this impact recruiting? Now I know um, people aren't going to judge and say, "Oh, I'm not going to Iowa because of one game," but it, it has to have some sort of impact. You've been through this process before, 
We had the Penn State game. I mean, emotions were high. Recruiting was trending up. We asked, we saw three or four guys decommit from their schools. All of a sudden, Iowa might be having an amazing you know class from a star perspective. Uh, Xavier was trending towards Iowa. We had Kyler Casper was like, oh, my gosh, this school is great. Of course, Kevin's always going to talk very highly of Iowa. But um, if you're if you're Kyler looking at this offense, you got to be a little concerned about what you're seeing. Um, how does it, how does this impact recruiting? Have you been through a situation like this and when you were going through recruiting? Uh, just kind of walk me through that, please. Uh, I guess mm, no, <laughs> not in a sense, no. Um, because I mean, I was committed to Boston College, uh, before you know I was committed to Iowa, and you know Boston College wasn't good, uh, to begin wasn't that great to begin <laughs> with, um, and then they were even worse, like, um. The year before, or so was that twenty twelve? They're even worse, and they like let go of, like their entire staff and everything. Um, and obviously, yeah, you're just like, okay, obviously, I open it, open it back up. This necessarily isn't that type of situation um, where uh, you know, obviously, the coaches we're not as bad staff, as Boston College. Yeah, we're not yeah the entire staff, staff isn't getting tire fired, right? So that's obviously not an issue, right? But um, you know, when you look at uh, so first off, obviously defense, you're like, hey, if I hey, if I come to Iowa and play defense, right, I'm going to play all the time. I'm going to be getting my reps in. Hey, people are going to be able to see me, all this and that. You're like, OK, cool. Uh, so, you know, you might not think about that as much. Right. But, um, you know, on the offensive side of the football, you think about it, you're like, man, if I'm a receiver. Right. I don't know, you know, what my production is going to be. Right. It could be uh, really good. Right. Or, you know, we could struggle to pass the football. Right. So I don't know if it's a place where I would end up want to go. Right. Um, and then I, but obviously like running backs, right. You know, you're going to get the football. You're going to be working to the offense no matter what. Um, but from, you know, receiver spot perspective, right. That can be, that can be a little bit uh, scary or hesitant. Right. Cause you're like, you know, I don't know if I'll be able to make an impact because I don't know how many opportunities I'm even going to get to get to catch the football. So um, when you have offensive performances like that, yeah, it can be, uh, oh, I guess it can be a little bit scary, I guess, in the recruiting side of things, right? You know, you don't know what, um, what that's going to look like, you know, whether it's week to week, right? Because it feels like, you know, we have a different offensive performance, yeah. you know, every single, every single, um, Saturday, uh, right? So, you know, it can't, I don't really know, like, kind of where I'm going, but I do know that, um, you know, having performances like that does not help recruiting at all, um, and, you know, hopefully that these guys can, you know, help write the ship. And then who knows, right? Maybe these guys are like, hey, uh, obviously, right, the guys that are in, you know, right now aren't getting it done. So, hey, maybe I can I can come in, right, and make that impact, right, and make the change um, where, you know, maybe guys, we can make an impact, right? I mean, you got, you do have some freshmen or younger players that are coming in and playing, playing now. I mean, um, obviously got Keegan, you know, we got Arlen Bruce, right? He's been in there. Um, obviously, we got... Uh, Gavin Williams, right, who played pretty, pretty good amount of snaps yesterday as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, having having young guys in, you're like, hey, maybe I can be that next young guy in, right, and I can help, um, you know, create some change in the offense. So, um, you know, it's kind of kind of a two-way street. Um, but, you know, hopefully, like, in the grand scheme of things, right, the obviously the coaches are continuing to preach to, to you know, recruits and stuff like, hey, you know, obviously we had a bad week and we had a bad string of weeks, but you know, we're obviously trying to write the ship. That's why we're trying to get you into the building. Right. So yeah. <laughs> kind of, kind of uh, put it like that. I mean, you can, you can basically flip any storyline to be whatever or fit whatever narrative you want. We're not yeah. playing well. So let's get you in. We are playing well. Look how good you'd be in here. So yeah. uh, definitely, definitely makes sense. I would agree. Defensively speaking, I don't know how you don't, I don't know how you watch the Iowa defense and not think, yeah, I want to be there, especially mm -hmm. the defensive back. I don't know how you watch the Iowa defense and think, I don't want to play for Phil Parker. I mean, yeah. Riley Moss was a gray shirt who ended up being put on scholarship late and then started his freshman year and performed pretty well. He had some ups and downs. And now he's <laughs> now he's projected to be potentially a second-round draft pick. I mean, um, yes, part of that is evaluating talent and finding guys who maybe are under the radar. But mm -hmm. there's also some development in that as well. And a lot of that comes from Phil Parker, what he does with defensive backs. I don't know how you can't look at that as a defensive back and say, yes, I got to go play there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that that pretty much does it. LaShawn, anything else you want to cover on the show today? Anything you want to cover about this this team? Um, I guess for me personally, I just want to wrap it up with saying, 
we have four more games left, and we're going to be favored in all those four games. And there's still a lot to play for on the table. I mean, this team could still go 10-2. and two. We're not facing a defense like we did against Wisconsin. Nebraska's defense is solid, but we're not facing a defense like we have in Wisconsin or Penn State again. Still a lot to play for. We still can go 10-2. and two. We still could go to a big bowl. We might not win the Big Ten West, which is very annoying and frustrating, but we can still have a lot of things to play for. Anything else you want to say before we wrap up the show? No, nah, just, you know, <laughs> as an offensive Rough. player, watching us on offense has been painful this year, and I'm hoping, 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 right, we can get some some change going around, get some positive positive performances on the ground, which we haven't really been able to, to really get. Um, I feel like we haven't really got anything kind of going offensively. So watching us on offense does bring me so much pain and I'm hoping, Hey, maybe they get a little kick. That was a kick in the butt. Right. And, you know, we can, you know, get back on track because again, we still got some, um, big games, you know, for the rest of the year. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll go out there and be able to perform for them. So, but no, I mean, that's really pretty much it for me. Um, you know, again, appreciate you having me on and, and go Hawks. Yeah, man. As always, uh, it's a, a pleasure having you on. Uh, we hate we hate recapping losses. It would be good to recap a win every single time. But nevertheless, here we are. We're doing it. We got you all breaking broke down with what happened in this game. We'll be covering Iowa Hawkeye football the rest of the week as well. We're also going to be start covering some women's basketball, some men's basketball, and some wrestling. All that stuff is kicking off this upcoming couple of weeks. So lots of fun stuff coming in Iowa Hawkeye Nation. Plus, we have field hockey as well. We're our number one ranked team. They did suffer a loss, but they are performing very well on pace to potentially win a national championship. So a lot of good stuff going on in Iowa Hawkeye Nation. Um, while all of you might be a little sad about football, which I am as well, uh, lots of good things going on at Hawkeye Nation. Thank you all for listening in to this episode of the Locked on Hawkeyes podcast. Have a fantastic weekend and even better Monday, and let's go Hawks.